Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trasha Schwendener with Accutech. I'm here to welcome you all, all the members from the Accutech family, as well as from RT. We have Joe Jakovich and David Ricks on the phone. Um, he, they're going to walk us through. We're going to turn it over to, to Joe in just a moment. I'm going to let David do some introductions, but we're here today to talk about um, the FDIC broker deposit rule, and we thank Joe and David for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Dave right now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Trasha. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I also want to thank uh, Trasha and Accutech for allowing to host this event as well. Um, Joe's going to go through some informative stuff here, and then um, at the end, we'll ask for any questions that there might be. But with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Jakovic. David, Trasha, thank you so much. Uh, so let's start. You know, before we start the presentation, I, I think let's really level set what we're talking about in terms of uh, the assets of your typical trust customer. Uh, what we're focused on today uh, has nothing to do with the 95% uh, of the portfolios that are focused on equity, fixed income, mutual funds, ETFs. It's really focused only on the cash portion of your customer portfolios and how uh, a recent rule by the FDIC has impacted uh, the decisions that you might want to consider as a trust provider in terms of whether you're still using money market funds to maybe maybe now's the time to consider uh, using a bank suite product or if you're using a, a bank suite product already maybe you need to change it a bit in order to take advantage of some of the aspects of the rule that again impact banks and, and again with with the bank suite pro programs and the impact of this rule it's not so much how it impacts you as a trust company directly, but rather the banks that are ultimately going to be receiving some of your customer deposits via a bank suite program. And again, focused on that, you know, five to 10% of your typical customer portfolio that has excess cash. So with that, let's get started. So a little bit about R&T. R&T has been in the sweep space uh, since 1974. Initially, we started with money market funds. In fact, we had launched the fourth ever money market fund. For many years, that was our sweep product of choice. In 2007, we launched our first bank sweep product. And in 2015, we actually sold our money market funds to exclusively uh, focus on the bank sweep products. Uh, that we're going to talk about today. So in terms of uh, Rich and Tang, we've been, in, been doing this for a long time, 45 plus years. Uh, the management team at R&T has been uh, collectively employees for over 100 years. Uh, we have 116 billion of assets under administration, uh, large number of institutional relationships. And let's get started. So it's not typical that a, that a rule that impacts banks is going to have any uh, direct or in, indirect impact, you know, to a typical uh, trust uh, portfolio. But this one's a little bit different. You know, for many years, and again, from the perspective of the bank, uh, banks, uh, there was some uncertainty in terms of whether a particular deposit at a bank was core versus brokered. And these are important distinctions for a bank, not so much from you know, the typical uh, you know, trust or uh, perspective, but from the bank, whether the funds coming into their institution were one or the other made an important difference. And the rule change that occurred last year provide important clarifications as to what uh, types of customers fall into that category uh, of brokered versus others that don't. And these rules are first written in the early 1990s. So you can imagine there was a, uh, a significant need to reflect some of the new developments in the industry and so on and so forth. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. 
So what's so, what's so horrible about broker deposits? Well, they get a bad reputation in the 1980s, you know, as a significant factor that caused the, the, the run on savings and loans institutions and so on and so forth. So there were rules that were originally developed uh, to sort of prevent uh, that from reoccurring again. But as with any rulemaking, there are sometimes some unintended consequences where the net's a little too broad. However, uh, in any case, whether when a deposit is characterized as a broker deposit, it generally, from the regulatory perspective, uh, is, is there's there's a certain association of instability that you know when you really need those deposits, they're not going to be there for you, and that filtered into the banks because again, as the regulators would come in, uh, they would want to make sure that there was. Uh, not very high concentrations of what were considered broker deposits. So generally speaking, a bank will pay less for broker deposits and provide less in terms of capacity. So that, you know, that's an important thing that we're going to hone in on and, 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 and going to the next slide. What opportunity there is for uh, trust customers to benefit from this rule is if if there's a way in the sweep programs if there's a way that if for some reason or another the banks that are receiving deposits today that they are being considered brokered is there a way that maybe to restructure those relationships such that they can be considered non-brokered and why does that benefit you and potentially your customers is that for non-broker deposits or poor, as they're often called, banks typically pay more in interest and they like more of them, which in this environment where there's tremendous excess liquidity in the markets is a very valuable aspect as well, just getting banks to take deposits. So again, I promise not to get too in the weeds of, of the rule, but I think it's important for you to know kind of where trust companies and their customers underlying deposits fall in terms of the standard definition of a deposit broker. In the, at the very high level, in terms of when a deposit broker is defined, it does include a trust company. So that at, from the default perspective, uh, general rule, a trust company is a deposit broker. Therefore, deposits coming through a trust company would, absent an exception, which we'll get to, be considered to be a broker deposit, okay? However, as we're gonna go through, there's three ways now that a broker, that a trust company can send deposits to a bank on behalf of its customers in a way that is no longer considered brokered, okay? The first one. The first one is actually one that already existed, and it was primarily beneficial for trust departments of banks. So not separately incorporated trusts or independent trust companies. It was really focused on, other than special situations, which are listed here as well, the primary application of the statutory rule, we call it, and this is the one that existed since the very beginning, was that if a trust department is placing deposits into a financial institution, and that trust is not set up for the sole purpose of you know, getting additional FDIC insurance, then they will not, by definition, or by statutory, by statute, be considered a deposit broker. So the trust departments, for the most part, always have the ability to treat their deposits, or the banks receiving those deposits, have the ability to treat them as non-brokered. However, there's tremendous uncertainty with respect to separately incorporated trust companies and with respect to independent trust companies. And that thankfully was resolved. And that was a very important aspect of this new rulemaking is that the FDIC provided guidance to banks, which kind of create a level playing field. Okay, let's continue. The first item is what's called the 25% rule. And this 
resolves the uncertainty primarily for the separately incorporated and independent trusts, where as long as the underlying uh, portfolio, really the, the line of business of your trust assets and your trust business, as long as less than 25% of your entire book, you know, excluding stocks and bonds and ETFs, mutual funds, as long as less than 25% is in banks, you qualify for this exception. Now, my experience is, and I think this is a pretty safe statement to make, is that most trust companies have well below 25% in cash. In fact, it's usually, in my experience, somewhere between 5 and 10%. So most trust companies will qualify for this 25% rule, which again, just to stick with the point here, that will allow potentially that trust company to place deposits at a bank that will be treated more favorably as non-brokered. Now, what, are, what do you have to do to get that treatment? Very easy. You just have to file a notice with the FDIC. It's not an application. You don't have to wait for approval. There's a form you fill out, you file with the FDIC. Within a matter of minutes, you get a response, and you're done. And I recommend you keep all that paperwork because any bank that you uh, potentially will work with uh, to obtain this favorable treatment will want to see that documentation. The notice contents are pretty straightforward. We don't really need to go into that in detail. Uh, but there is an on ongoing requirement that every quarter you'll just have to provide data to the FDIC saying, yep, we still qualify. Uh, less than 25% of our book is in cash. And so that's the second exception. There's one more that allows, again, banks to treat the deposits coming from trust companies as non-brokered, okay? Well, actually, before we get to the third one, the... Uh, I think one one point I'll, I'll mention here briefly, but we'll address in one of the examples coming up, is that with respect to setting up uh, a relationship with uh, a bank, or some of you, some of you may be involved with relationships where your relationship isn't directly with a bank, but rather you work with a third party that kind of orchestrates the program. That's where you need to be careful. This isn't always the case in terms of whether uh, kind of what I'm about to tell you uh, is the result, but you have to be careful because one of the things that the uh, rulemaking requires is that for any third party that's involved in the uh, relationship between the trust company who's acting on behalf of their customers and a bank that's involved in a bank suite program, any third party kind of in the middle there, you have to do a special analysis to see if they're acting as a deposit broker. The answer depends on the facts and circumstances. There are situations where that administrator is not uh, performing uh, various aspects that would cause them to be a, a deposit broker, but many times there are. But I think it's fair to say the existence of a third party uh, in between that relationship makes it unclear and actually makes certain banks uncomfortable versus a more direct relationship. And just keep that in the back of your mind. When we go through some of the examples, I'll kind of resurrect that thought and uh, it may make more sense then. So again, getting back to the third item that would be the third exception that would allow a bank to not treat a deposit as a broker deposit is this exclusive deposit arrangement, where it seems pretty uh, commonsensical, but it was very helpful that the FDIC put this into the rulemaking. And it basically is simple as this, is that if a trust company acting on behalf of their customers transacts with only one bank, where they have an exclusive arrangement, where they don't have any other banking relationships, well then by definition, they cannot be a deposit broker because they're only working with one bank. And that's, that's pretty helpful as well, because again, uh, 
Many trust companies are smaller, and that really, as we'll go through in some examples, will meet their requirements. And given the existence of certain, uh, uh, as we'll go through in detail later, reciprocal deposit programs, one bank is is sufficient to satisfy the needs for its uh, trust customer base. And the nice thing about having an exclusive deposit arrangement is that you really don't have to bother with the notice filing requirements I described before under the 25% rule. But there you have it. Those are the three ways that a trust company, whether it's a department, again, a trust department generally relies on the statutory rule, but now with the existence of the 25% rule and this exclusive deposit rule, you now have a level playing field where that all types of trust companies can now meet that requirement. So before I go on to, uh, through the examples, I just want to uh, make clear, I should have said this at the beginning, please ask questions. You know, I, I think to the extent, uh, you know, I certainly love talking about this stuff, but it's it, to the extent that I can help you understand it better and apply it to your specific circumstances, I'm happy to do so. Uh, so please, either through the chat or through the questions, uh, application through uh, this webinar, uh, please do so, and we'll certainly get to it at the end. Uh, so example number one, and again, starting very basic, uh, many of you probably still continue to use money market funds, and I think it's a good uh, place to start in terms of uh, comparing uh, the other uh, bank sweep arrangements. Uh, so you have a, a trust company, that is placing its customers, its excess cash, again, that 5 to 10% of their portfolio, sweeps automatically overnight into a money market fund. Well, some of the observations are that money is not FDIC insured. If you're a trust company affiliated with a bank, you're pretty much just letting money walk out the door. Particularly if that bank needs, needs deposits, your trust company is an excellent source of strong, stable, uh, deposits. But when you use money market funds, that, that opportunity is not there. The money market fund structure is very rigid. Uh, through a series of share class structures and so on and so forth, you have limited options in terms of you know, the rates that you could set for your clients, uh, how uh, beneficial you want to do householding or any other rewards program. And the yields are pretty low. So again, going on to example two, you know, it's the same trust company, but it's using a, a product called, and again, this is a, a Rich and Tang uh, R&T product called the Demand Deposit Marketplace. And very simply, the Ma Demand Deposit Marketplace works in this example where you have a trust company that instead of using money market funds has decided to use some sort of uh, bank suite vehicle. Uh, it could be something like the demand deposit marketplace program like that we operate where that uh, basically the trust company can open up a direct relationship and be a sending institution into that program and send our underlying trust customer balances and, and get access to FDIC insurance up to $30 million, sort of on a one-way basis. It's very similar in structure to if you would uh, engage a third-party provider to do a private network, where that you'd have an administrator who would assist the trust company to open up, you know, five or ten uh, direct bank accounts, and then allocate them accordingly to offer. Uh, a certain amount of FDIC insurance. Typically about, in those structures, it's usually two and a half million or, or less. Uh, but in terms of the observations here, the results are kind of the same. Customer cash balances, when they're received, the trust customer cash balances when they're received by the banks in these scenarios, are going to be considered brokered most often. Okay, that is because you either have the third party involved uh, in the negotiation, in the setting of terms, or what's called matchmaking. So in th this arrangement, you absolutely get the FDIC insurance, 
And again, depending on the structure you use, if you use a program like our Demand Deposit Marketplace program, you can get up to $30 million of insurance. For a more tailored, special, specialized program, you get uh, access to insurance, but usually a lesser amount. And the uh, rate, however, is very is impacted by this classification of it being a broker deposit versus a non-broker deposit. So I think in summary here is that you're better off, and I think this is where a lot of you are today, because this, you know, to be honest, before the uh, the rules made it clear last year, these were the largest the two options. You had the kind of the one way. Uh, trust company structure where you're sending your balances into uh, a bank suite program and a money market fund. So let, let's move on to, to kind of some of the new developments that I think is uh, really exciting and something, uh, if you take anything away from this presentation, this is something you need to uh, you know consider. Um, and I'm going to skip to example four. So example four basically is the same uh, concept where you have your customers going into a bank. And in this example, I, I assumed it to be a, a trust department. So it's a trust department that's associated with an affiliated bank. And an important aspect here is that the affiliated bank is actually looking for deposits. So that by establishing a relationship with the with the uh, affiliated bank, the uh, trust department is able to, you have two choices. Either the bank can keep those deposits and insure them up to 250000 and if necessary, if there's uninsured amounts, they would have to collateralize them. Or, because that's not so easy and there's a lot of headaches to doing that, what many banks are doing is that they're starting to use uh, programs like the Demand Deposit Marketplace program, not on a one-way basis, but what's referred to on a reciprocal basis. And why is that important? Well, there's, there's two things, a little bit of history here. In 2018, there was a law that was passed by Congress and adopted by the FDIC that recognized uh, one, the existence of reciprocal deposits and how they work. And basically how they work is that you have a, uh, a bank has a customer, a large customer. Just say for purposes of this example, there's a $30 million trust customer. And they want to have that relationship, but you know they could only offer $250,000 of insurance. Well, how these reciprocal deposit programs work is that the bank can send that $30 million into the DDM program, okay? Within the DDM program, that 30 million gets allocated across 120 plus banks, fully FDIC insured. And because the DDM program is a network with hundreds of banks and hundreds of institutions like the trust company, we're, they're solving that problem for banks throughout the country. So that the program in turn can send $30 million back to the bank, the affiliated bank in this example, in increments of $250,000. So, so where are we right now? We have a trust company client, $30 million, fully FDIC insured. You have a affiliated bank in this example that has $30 million that it can use to lend and do whatever it wants to do with. What was important about that 2018 rule was that those deposits, as long as they were non-brokered on the way into the bank, which they clearly were because it's from a trust department, the fact that they're reciprocated to provide that FDIC insurance does not change that classification. Before 2018, it did change the classification. Afterwards, it doesn't. So that's an important aspect. So that um, in terms of this example, when we go through the observations, Yes, the customers are getting up to $30 million of FDIC insurance. Check. That's great. Because these deposits are non-brokered, it doesn't have the taint. They don't have the taint associated with the brokered deposits 
So based on our experience, and we see this every day, banks are willing to pay much more for broker deposit for non-broker deposits than broker deposits. So just to put numbers on that, in the last example, we looked at two basis points as being the going rate for broker deposits. I'd say in the in the market for non-broker deposits, it could be 10, 15 times that amount, just to give you a sense. Okay, so I think in terms of the final example here, and I know we're going through a lot, is that this only doesn't, this because of the new rule, that whole reciprocal concept doesn't just work for trust departments anymore. Because of the uh, three exceptions to the trust companies themselves being considered brokers, brokers or deposit brokers, it also works for all types of trust companies. So that, take this situation. You have a trust company, okay? Separately incorporated entity that establishes a relationship with a bank. Okay, it doesn't have to be affiliated, it's a third party bank. And basically, um, they negotiate a rate because the bank will basically have a direct relationship with the trust company. And the trust company and the bank will come to terms. Trust company will use the bank's access to the DDM program because the Banks in this example uh, use R&T as a vendor. So there's no need for the trust company to have a separate administrator to run a bank suite program for them, which has a high probability of being treated as brokered. But rather, they can go to whether it's a local bank down the street, uh, a bank they have a relationship, a uh, long-term relationship, or even a list of banks that is provided by R&T uh, that just identifies banks at which we have uh, a reciprocal uh, capability with. So that, again, through these relationships, using the three ways to be considered a non-broker deposit, trust companies can now have a pretty certain, a very certain way to develop direct relations with the banks that will be considered core, and therefore, result in higher rates and more capacity. And with that, I am going to, I think there might be one more slide, which I think is very important to say. Again, you know, we appreciate the uh, platform that Acutech gave us today to kind of share some of these thoughts. Uh, this entire capability uh, that I'm referring to with the reciprocal deposits, the banks, uh, is all available through the Accutech platform. Accutech provides uh, an important role for all types of bank sweep relationships that we provide, uh, where that they provide us with all the underlying uh, data and transactions so that by partnering with Accutech, who in turn partners with Rich and Tang in the DDM program, we can take your customer balances, whether you're coming in one way, like we talked about in one of the early examples, or if you're coming in through another bank on a reciprocal basis, Accutech provides us all the information necessary in either structure uh, to, in, to enable us to fully FDIC insure your customers. So with that, I am going to pause. I'm going to ask the team to see if we've received any questions at all and I'd love to answer them at this time. I do see I have some questions on the chat, but I just wanna see if we have any other questions. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Uh, let me look on the chat here. Uh, there's one question that, do we need to find the banks? Again, as I mentioned before, and I assume what we're, what we're referring to here is that with a reciprocal relationship, this is kind of what we're, uh, what we think is the preferred way to uh, enter into these types of bank suite platforms. 
how do trust companies find uh, those banks with whom to establish a relationship? Well, we've seen multiple approaches here. Many trust companies, well, have affiliated banks, and I think that's a natural starting point to the extent that there is uh, a need for deposits at those institutions. But again, as I mentioned before, we can certainly provide you with a list of banks with, wh with whom we already have a vendor relationship um, that you can uh, use as a starting point as well. Or even better, if you have a relationship that you would like to uh, place deposits through, and even if uh, they currently don't have DDM as, a, as an option through that bank, we're certainly well, willing to establish one in order to support you know, your particular relationship. The other question is that, uh, I guess in the example, uh, we provided just one bank, you know, and, and there's a concern about concentration risk. Uh, where that, I think for, what you need to understand is that with, again, at the end of the day, uh, whether you're coming in through a bank or coming directly into the DDM program, you're always gonna have access to the 120 plus banks to get access to $30 million of insurance. But what some trust companies have done is that instead of coming in through one bank relationship, they may have multiple and that works too. There's no limit to the number of reciprocal relationships that you could establish uh, with banks in order to get access to the DDM program. And you could also do it in combination. You could also have a, uh, I'll call it the, the core routine through a, non, through a reciprocal relationship and also a one-way structure. So a question came through. Um, does this mean the bank side could perhaps use the trust department for large deposit customers, so they wouldn't have to collateralize if we did a reciprocal arrangement? Yes, uh, that is a, uh, you know, in many conversations that we have, it's often a light bulb moment when, you know, we're talking to, you know, where the initial conversation might be, no, it's okay, we're good, you know, we have an affiliated bank, they, they take our sweep deposits. Uh, but w sometimes with the trust company, may not uh, appreciate at the bank level is that to the extent they're sending them balances in excess of 250000 there is a requirement for the bank to uh, segregate collateral uh, against those balances. And, you know, and you see this in a number of uh, banking aspects, whether it be in this case or with uh, municipal funds and so on and so forth. It it's, can be very difficult and time consuming and costly so that uh, oftentimes, a conversation might start with the trust company, and the CFO of the bank just may be listening into the conversation, and then all of a sudden starts paying attention, saying, "You mean I don't have to do that anymore?" And the answer is yes. You, you, that's absolutely correct. You no longer need to collateralize the balances because they will be fully FDIC insured through the DDM network. Any other questions, Melissa? No, unless you see where that came through the chat. No, I think we're uh, okay. There is one more on, uh, and again, this is a little bit involved, but uh, for those of you who are um, in tune with uh, uh, the uh, broker dealer suite programs, what we have seen, and again, this is just an observation is that we've seen many trust companies, uh, when they're setting up their own bank suite programs, look to the broker-dealer suite programs as a model. Where it, and that model tends to be one where you hire an administrator, a third party, and again, warning sign, as, as I mentioned before. And based on that, they pretty much replicate what the broker-dealers are doing, not realizing that the broker dealers don't have a choice. They're setting up their programs in accordance with FINRA guidelines and it's structured for that purpose. And it's very rigid. You need a third party administrator in most cases. And by following these rules, in many respects, 
you increase your chances that the deposits at the banks will be considered brokered because there's that third party involved and, and so on and so forth. Trust companies do not have to set up their programs that way. In fact, uh, you know, because of this new rule uh, and with the combination of the 2018 uh, you know, guidance on reciprocal deposits, it is now much better not to do it like the broker dealers, but rather to establish a direct relationship, whether it be an affiliated bank or a third party bank and take advantage of these new rules the existing reciprocal deposit rules and uh, being able to access these programs efficiently through partners like Accutech. And since there are no more questions and no more chats, uh, I want to say thank you very much. It's been our pleasure to uh, present to you all. And if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at the information on the slide. Uh, any question is, is welcome, so don't hesitate and have a wonderful day and a happy, happy holiday and happy new year. Thank you.